All right, guys, morning. Um, welcome to a new week, right? Uh, second week of 2021, so exciting stuff. So um, I'm not going to lie, we're a little bit behind um, with all the COVID craziness and stuff. I think I already told you guys that. So we are going to fly through the rest of the scientific revolution and probably go pretty quickly through um, the Enlightenment as well. Because, again, I know, yeah, each of one of you had me before, I believe for pre-AP, yeah. So we've already done that stuff, you know, so I'm not, I will go over the stuff, of course, that um, College Board, right, requires more that I didn't cover with you guys, but I'm not, you know, going to spend two or three weeks on it. So if you didn't look at the lesson plans, I believe we have a test on this by um, the end of the week. So I'm just going to do one note lecture. Um, it's pretty straightforward, probably three or four major concepts you need to understand, especially for our test. You already did your DBQ, the day the day car, um, take home one or whatever you want to say. So that won't be included with the test. I believe there is an LAQ or SAQ on there, but I'll let you know um, as we get there. Okay, so um, scientific revolution, right? Um, so after these ancient philosophers, right, like Ptolemy and Socrates and Aristotle, right, and Plato and all those guys you probably heard of, yeah, the Middle Ages, right? And again, in the Middle Ages, education and learning was highly frowned upon. So the, basically the Catholic Church, right, became the center of all government, of all authority, um, as we, or at least you, probably have already learned that. No. So like it says here, right, the medieval view of the world was highly religious, right? Your, your main goal was getting to heaven. That was basically it. Um, political theory, you know, was largely based on the idea that God chose kings, right? The divine right theory. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with no education, you're constantly, right, in a state of curiosity, right? You're constantly in a state of gullibility as well, right? Because you don't know what's truth and what's not, so you're, you're, you're likely to believe false sources, right? So it was really easy to manipulate people back then. And think of the, like the witch trials and stuff. I mean, I know it wasn't quite then. They did have a witchcraft hysteria before um, the big ones you guys know about um, that we've already talked about, kind of. But anyway, my point is, right, religion is the main be-all. So that's why you read the Copernicus primary source, which I'll talk to you about. You can see, even though he's of a science mind, he's still largely um, under the wing and guise of the Catholic Church. So... Um, all of the views um, that the ancient philosophers developed without, how can I say? Well, I'm going to say without anything, but without real technology, right? Um, is what all the Middle Ages uh, believed in. So what, like 800 to 900 years? Just constantly preaching these, you know, centuries upon centuries old theories that have never been proven so people grow up in that state and in that time period in ignorance, right? I mean, they're pretending as if they know the truth because the church and right stuff is telling them that they know the truth, but they really don't, right? They haven't proven it. There's no facts or evidence to back up their claims, right? Um, so you need to understand one of the first major concepts, of course, is understanding what it was like in the Middle Ages in terms of their views. Um, but secondly, you know, why did the scientific revolution happen? Um, so, how can I say this? Coming out of the Middle Ages, right, in the high Middle Ages, when you had, like, the plague, right, and all those things, we were starting to see, um, remember that, I can't remember if you guys did that earlier this year, but anyway, never mind. I'm getting away from myself. But anyway, scholasticism, right? We talked about that in Europe. Um, there had all been these universities had been starting to be set up at this time um, with those universities being set up and eventually with the Renaissance, renewed focus on study of the natural world. Um, we're going to see them become major centers of science, of course. Um, the church is totally against science, right? Because science often can use physical evidence from the natural world to disprove the church. And that's what, you know, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, all these people, right, face great persecution. Um, and what's the word I'm looking for? Um, fear of the Catholic Church, because Catholic Church burned people at the stake as being heretics. I mean, that happened 
you know, pretty frequently. So if you're a scientist, you know, you got to kind of be careful. You know, the church still is the main power. So Renaissance, of course, is a huge, um, even though there's not a big part on it here in terms of its contribution to the scientific revolution, it's huge. Um, because now people are starting to see that they can make money off of the natural world too through resources and things, right? So that right garnishes more interest in the physical world and the natural world. And that's exactly what science is, right? Science is the study of the physical earth or world, right? Things you can taste, touch, smell, hear, right? Those sort of things. Um, I, I think probably the biggest, though, cause of the scientific revolution, or at least... Not the whole scientific revolution, but at least what the scientific revolution started with, which was astronomy, largely comes from, right, the age of exploration. All right. Um, by the end of the 1400s, going into the 1500s, so scientific revolution starts roughly 1550, 1600, somewhere in there, right? Um, trying to find better ways to navigate. And before the compass, right, your, your main navigational tool is a star. So, of course, with this renewed interest in exploring becomes a renewed interest in navigation, which means a renewed interest in astronomy, right, which will lead to all of these new discoveries because by this time, humans are starting to develop new technologies, right? And those technologies will be hugely important, right, to proving their theories and making them fact, right? which will become a big problem for the church, as we'll talk about, right? Um, so you had new things that developed. The telescope, of course, which would be Galileo's, right? Um, a big piece of technology he uses to disprove the theory of the Catholic Church that heaven is in the sky um, or in space, I guess you would say. Um, but other things, the microscope, of course, is hugely important, especially to the development of germ theory, right, and um, overall health and sanitation of humans, I guess you would say. Okay, make sure you know Bacon and Descartes, right? Descartes' views of how to determine truth from, I guess, or I should say more reality versus non-reality, um, really helps Bacon and the scientific methods. Make sure you know to those two guys, Bacon develops a uniform and formal way to conduct science, which is the scientific method. And that scientific method will no longer, or at least eventually, will be no longer based on deductive logic, right? Assuming you know the truth and trying to prove it, but rather inductive reasoning, which is, I don't know the truth, I'm trying to get to it, right? Um, that's probably the best way of summing that up. All right, so um, we already talked about these things, right? Um, Scientific revolution, though, is going to become extremely important with war, right? You definitely going to see war technologies and things. Um, arms become more deadly, uh, which will lead to more death and violence in wars, right? Um, plus revolution, because guns and gunpowder are going to become a mainstay pretty much in societies. But we'll come back. So anyway, scientific revolution starts with astronomy again, largely because of the age of exploration happening around the time, or at least getting to its peak, I guess I would say, around the time of the start of the scientific revolution. So Copernicus, right, you already read um, primary source from him. So again, very, very Catholic guy, all right? Um, so unlike Galileo, when Copernicus gets in trouble with the church, he's going to recant. He's going to say, okay, blah, blah, blah. like a lot of these findings and things that you see here, these books and stuff that he came up with will not come to light till much later. Um, almost much later, but later. Um, after, I believe it was after his death. Um, because again, he basically hid it because he was afraid of the church. But then, you know, these future scientists and astronomers will get hold of what he said, right? And will continue to build on those theories. That's what, that's what progress is, right? You're building off of, how can I say, you're always trying to build to make better right? Um, stagnation, like it was in the Middle Ages, is not progress, obviously, right? Um, so science is the constant building of ideas and theories and, you know, evidence and facts to prove those theories. I mean, look at, I always use the cell phone as an example, right? It started with a piece of wire and a 
cup basically in a tub with water to make like, you know, like very primitive stuff. And look where we are now, right? You have computers in your hands. It's just constant building, right, off of previous ideas and theories. So his idea, unlike Ptolemy, right, the ancient Greek astronomer um, who said that the Earth is the center of all things, um, Copernicus will be one of the first people to challenge that view and the church's view, because the church held to the ancient Greek view, right, uh, that the Earth was the center, because it also meant that humans uh, were the center of all things, which gives the church even more appearance of power, right, and importance. If Earth and humans are seen kind of as, as more insignificant, maybe more people aren't as willing to be as afraid of the church, or, you know, but you get what I'm saying, how it kind of stains um, the image or authority or power of the church. So yeah, you, heliocentric, we talked at great lengths about this already, right? The sun is the center, but it still had a number of problems, right? For one, that the orbits of the planets, um, he held the fact that he thought that they were circular, um, not circular, right? But point is Copernicus taking the first steps. So again, like it says here in underline, right? It seems to challenge the Bible's book of Genesis that put forth the geocentric view that was probably learned by those people back then who wrote the Bible um, by the ancient Greeks, or at least from ancient Greek study and learning. So like I said, the religious reaction to Copernicus. The Catholic Church basically goes on a bender and starts basically trying to arrest anyone and uh, basically silence uh, anyone who challenges their views or authority, which is only going to hurt them even more, right? Because it's going to make them look like tyrants and it's going to give them a bad name and a bad image, and right? So that's where, like, later the the Reformation and stuff come in, comes in. Okay, so um, kind of interesting, though, that even, you know, some of these heavily, like, revolutionary Christians like Martin Luther and John Calvin even were against Copernicus's theory, um, these were not people of science, right? These were people of religion. And even though they were challenging religion, they were still of a very religious mindset. They were not scientific-minded or thinking at all, right? Um, so that's one thing to point out. Because um, this is happening about the same time. I, I guess I should have pointed that out too. Um, the end of the Renaissance, the height of the Age of Exploration, uh, the Scientific Revolution, they're all happening, um, yeah, I mean, right around the same times. It's a lot of crazy things going on in the world at that time. Okay, so like I said here already, Catholic Church had already went, went after Copernicus and basically made him recant on um, his theories and proclaim these as false. But again, later, um, astronomers, scientists will get a hold of it, and basically the Catholic Church won't be able to, what's the word, stem the flood Um of like, how can I say this, negative feelings towards the church that will come because of their, you know, very brutal and authoritarian actions. I mean, like the Inquisition and stuff, the Crusades, um, you know, this this constant burning people at the stake and silencing people, right, who aren't falling exactly in line with their views of religion. So Tycho Bra Brahe, I think I'm saying that right. Um, no one ever, you don't hear his name very often. But basically what his work did was gave credence or authority to um, Copernicus. Because Copernicus, when he did this, he didn't have a lot of great facts or data or equations to back up what he said. Um, his things were just basically like roundabout theories. Okay, if this, you know, looks like this at this time of the day, and this, you know what I mean? There's no real science or, I'm not science, math or real evidence to back it up. So that's where Brahe comes in. Um, his data proved Copernicus's theory. Like I said, later, when Copernicus writes this stuff and establishes it, it's not going to be followed. It won't come till later until scientists like Brahe are able to prove it and basically show that, the, you know, the Catholic Church acting as tyrants. Okay, and it's kind of ironic that even though his work that proved Copernicus's theory, um, you know, 
will later come to light. He himself actually did not believe it. But again, his observatory, as it said up here, right, that he built and the data he collected will later be used by future scientists to prove Copernicus's theory. So Kepler, uh, if you look at the dates, 1571 to 1630, Copernicus much, much earlier, right? Like I told you guys, okay? Um, so Kepler um, is actually a Christian who's a scientist, and you don't see that very often. Um, he's a very devout Christian that's a scientist. Um, like I said, we're starting to move now into the later 1500s, and as more and more science and data is collected and the church seems to look more and more like liars or, you know, tyrants, whatever you want to say, um, science keeps building and building. And we start to see more and more Christians um, becoming involved with science. Like I said, most of these people are already Christians, but I, what I mean by that is more Christians willing to believe, I guess, in the findings of science is probably a better way of putting that. Okay, so Kepler basically uses Brahe's data and puts it into math to prove it. He also comes up with the three laws of planetary motion. Um, and again, in the big contribution, as we've already said a bunch of times, is that the orbits of the planets are not circular, but rather elliptical. All right, so Galo, uh, Galileo Galilei, right, um, probably the most famous of these um, early scientific astronomers, I guess you would say, and look at his date, right, he comes, he's like, of all these ones we've talked about so far, he's the latest, so he's taking all the findings of these early astronomers, Copernicus, uh, Brahe, um, Kepler, right, and he's putting them all into one huge theory to try to prove um, even bigger theories, like, for example, how does the universe work? Um, how does motion work? Like, how do the planets move? Why are stars at different points in the sky, at different, you know, points of the day or year? Those sort of things, right? So the laws of motion um, are huge, right, that he comes up with. And he largely does this with the telescope and, and observing basically distance factored in with, um, you know, how far away it is. These equations to try to determine, you know, how they move, why they're moving. Comes up with the law of inertia. Okay. Um, so he's able to further prove Copernicus's theory. So, right, Kepler used math. Brahe collected the data. Kepler um, put it into basically math, right? Now Galileo is going to physically show um, that these things... Are true. So he validates Copernicus's theory with the telescope. So he's not the first guy, again, to develop the telescope or the idea of a telescope, but he is the first guy to use a telescope powerful enough to actually see surfaces of planets far, far away. Okay. So he disproves a number of theories that the Catholic Church had put forward, like the stars, the bright lights are uh, angels. Um, that the sky is heaven, um, right? Those sort of things. So Galileo, though, um, I think I might have talked to you guys about this. Maybe I didn't. But unlike Copernicus, right, and a lot of these earlier astronomers, Galileo really wasn't as afraid of the Catholic Church. Like I said, we're seeing this trend of scientists moving further and further away from Christianity as time goes on because they're starting to basically see in their own mind's eye that the church had been lying for so long with their facts and their data and things like that, right? Um, so, but Galileo uh, basically criticized the church openly, and you don't do that. He more or less called them idiots in a very roundabout way. Um, so in 1633, uh, 33, excuse me, um, after Galileo published the dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, in which he included all of these earlier theories developed into one major, like I said, overview of how the universe works and stuff like that. Uh, the Inquisition of Pope Urban VII forced Galileo to retract his support of his Copernican theory. So they put him under house arrest, and they basically told him he's not allowed to write about it, he's not allowed to talk about it, that sort of thing. But before that happened, 
Galileo wrote something openly that basically called them idiots, even though it's not here in this note guy or these, these notes. Um, and that really ticked off the church even more. So they really went after him. So yeah, the Inquisition still existed. You know, I mean, the, the Crusades did happen in the 13, 1400s, but, you know, that was basically the military of the church. Right? And everyone was terrified of it. Um, so Galileo, yeah, basically finishes out his life, I believe, under house arrest. Um, and I believe before he died, uh, he retracted his support of the Copernican theory. But again, point was his findings, the things that he proves, uh, will be hugely important to this guy, Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton takes, again, this is what science is, right? Building off of what came before. So going to take Galileo's uh, laws of motion and Kepler's, well, yeah, uh, laws of motion basically that had developed before him to prove gravity and give an even further um, scientifically proven uh, view of the universe, which will further hurt the Catholic Church as well. So Newton, again, considered to be probably the greatest mind um, of the entire scientific revolution because he takes all of those findings before him. Look at his date, right? 1642, Galileo, Kepler, Copernicus takes them all and writes this, which is considered to be probably the most important book in science, uh, Principia, right? Na uh, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. So this gives people a better understanding of, you know, inertia and gravity and why things happen, that it's not necessarily God's active participation in the natural world that makes these things happen, that there's other forces that maybe, you know, just happen naturally. But then people would argue, well, the natural happening is God. But anyway, we're getting into a whole other philosophical debate with that, right? Um <clears throat> So this becomes basically deism, right? Um, the idea, I kind of consider my deist myself a deist in a way, I guess. I mean, I grew up under the Catholic Church, right? I had to go to church every weekend, every holiday, right? And, you know, growing up and getting older, uh, I kind of hold that view. There's a God. I know there's a God. I know there's, and again, this is just me speaking. You hold your own beliefs. I'm not telling you what to believe. This is just me, right? Um, I believe there's a God. I believe there's a creator, Um I have a hard time sometimes buying into some of those old stories, you know, um, that have no scientific basis, you know, and were written down by a bunch of ignorant, uneducated people. You know, I just, I don't know, but I do, I, I'm like a deist. I do believe there is a higher power or something, you know, seeing over everything, but I just don't know if I can buy into the Christian view of it, but that's just me. Again, I'm not telling you what to believe. Um, and I hope you don't hold it against me. That's just my opinion. Um, so again, scientific method is hugely important to the scientific revolution because now um, all scientists have a way of formally proving and showing their work, right? So the inductive method, we already talked about this, right? Um, renounce notions of what you know. So give up the fact, your ignorance, give up your ignorance, right? and begin to form an acquaintance with things, meaning start to look at things as if you don't know anything about them, right? Uh, look at them with an inquisitive mind, not as, okay, I know exactly what this is. Why is it this, right? That's not how you conduct science. So yeah, we were talking Bacon and Descartes together, help form the modern scientific method. So you already did your whole um, thing on him, right? So uh, like in the vocab... I pronounced this wrong. Cogito, cogito ergo sum, Latin. I think, therefore, I am. So I don't know if you guys are interested. I'll tell you about this again. I don't know if you watch Netflix or whatever, but there's a show on there now, Surviving Death, that just came out. And it goes over this whole Cartesian dualism thing. The idea of consciousness versus the idea of the physical body and the brain. Are they two separate things? Does the physical brain create consciousness? Right? These are... Again, highly philosophical, debatable things, but that's what Descartes was getting into. So it's still highly debated today and argued today as well. So we already talked about Cartesian dualism, the fact that the physical body 
has nothing to do with, according to Descartes, to consciousness or maybe what some in Christianity would even call the spirit, right? That there's something else not attached to the physical body. And he was starting to try to prove that. You know, that's a, that's a huge thing, right? So, yeah, they kind of give you this mnemonic device to trying to remember. I, you guys are working on that chart, which will be more helpful, helpful than this. But maybe for the AP test, maybe this would help you if you want to take the time to remember it. I've never learned that. CBK, GBDN, I, you know, I, cops bring kids great big donuts now. Hmm. Anyway, all right, moving on. So, with astronomy... That starts to prompt people to look more at other things in the physical world, not just the sky. So looking more at the physical body, right? That, that's what Descartes was starting to get into. Uh, physiology, biology, um, like plants and stuff. Like how do they, you know, wh what makes them alive or whatever, right? So scientists began challenging all of traditional Gre uh, Greek and Roman, excuse me, medical theories and medieval theories on health and disease. Um... So a lot of, remember this guy, because it's probably going to show up in the AP exam, so a lot of what the Middle Age believed as truth in terms of medicine and health and things like that was this guy Galen, uh, the ancient Roman physician Galen and his basically theories and findings. So he believed, if you look at this, uh, Galen, a proper balance of the four humors was needed to be healthy. Blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to delve any more into that, but bloodletting was a, excuse me. <laughs> bloodletting was a common method used to place the humors back into proper balance. So, yeah, you cut yourself and bleed. Leeches, big thing. Um, put nose on you to suck bad blood out of you. Yeah, it's yeah, obviously not supported by any kind of evidence or fact. Another big one, um, or I'm sorry, a new scientist will start looking further into challenging Galen's views and theories on anatomy and human body, physiology, those sort of things, was uh, Paracelsus. Paracelsus. Um, so his big contribution experiment with the use of various chemicals and drugs to deal with medical issues so he starts to develop and play with alchemy right and the development of modern medicine the use of ugh, the use of natural resources to heal the human all right so paracelsus make sure you remember his name he's definitely been there vesalius and harvey um are the first basically since ancient Greek and Roman times to open the human body. Because again, Christianity, you don't uh, desecrate the human body. That's created by God. So to desecrate the human body, even after it's dead, um, is still a big sin back then. So Vesalius and them, they kind of had to do this stuff in secret. They used to pay people secretly to get like cadavers for them, like bodies that just died. Um, but their findings in doing this Right will be hugely important to the development of modern medicine um, and medicine. So Harvey kind of is always mentioned with Vesalius. Um, basically, how can I say, he uses Vesalius' findings in the structure of the human body that he wrote and dissecting the human body um, to develop our first views of, or I should say first modern views of blood circulation and the heart and how blood moves through the body. You know, kind of interesting. So that's Harvey. Uh, Leeuwenhoek. Uh, this is the Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, the guy for microsco uh, microscopes. So first to develop theories and prove the existence of bacteria, uh, that there's actually organisms that we can't see in water. So that will be huge to germ theory. Right, and developing, again, sanitation um, in civilizations. Let's see what time it is here. All right. So this is huge. This is going to be on the test in the AP exam. So spreading these scientific ideas 
Um, how's that going to happen? Because, again, the church doesn't like this. They're going to do whatever they can to prevent it. So governments and monarchs start to encourage scientific inquiry because it helps with everything, um, military especially, you know, looking into better weaponry and things like that. Uh, so these scientific societies created a means by which scientists could communicate with each other. So it creates a community of scientists that can continue to share ideas. Why do you think, you know, like the e email and stuff so important today to learning and, and human growth? Because it, it allows you to easily share ideas and communicate and connect. All right. And that's what science is. Again, constantly building off of theories. All right. Um, so the impact obviously is going to lead to the enlightenment. You're going to see major improvements in exploration, of course, um, like the chronometer starting to finally determine safely latitude and longitude. Um, a lot of people say that the spirit of experimentation helped create or accelerate the agricultural revolution that we're going to learn about in um, England and other places in Europe. Of course, huge advances in medical knowledge. We start to see, how can I say, fanatical or um, religious-minded religious um, fanatics become less and less, uh, starting to discredit superstition, witchcraft as fallacies. Um, scientific revolution didn't come here to the United States. That's why the Salem witchcraft trials happened in the 1700s, because... We weren't seeing science and enlightenment ideals here yet. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, they're starting to realize, you know, that you know, that maybe witchcraft and these sort of things aren't exactly, you know, that dangerous or maybe even real at all. All right. So, where am I at here? Um, so, of course, after the... Um, like it says here, with the Catholic Counter-Reformation, church becomes highly hostile towards people of science. Science will decline because the Inquisition will be going after the likes of like people like Galileo, right, and other people that might come up with findings that would make the church look bad, because that's what the Counter-Reformation is, right, trying to restore the good name of the church. So this is why Protestant countries like Germany, England, become the leaders of science. They weren't restricting their people in progressing in it, like Catholic countries were, like Spain, and what was left of the Holy Roman Empire, right? So alchemy and astrology um, pretty much became the main focuses of the scientific revolution going into the Enlightenment. I mean, alchemy, you're trying to, like the Chinese have been trying to do for eternity, um, trying to find out, find the proper mixture or combination of natural elements to give eternal life. They've been trying to do that forever, you know. Um, why do you think in this country we have ginkoba, we have ginsana, we have all these Chinese herbs, um, you know, because their belief is they can better life in the human body through alchemy, you know. Um, when we talk about Paracelsus, right, and these guys... Um, so I'm not going to spend much more time on that. So yeah, I mean, all these scientists will become supported by monarchs and governments, which is hugely important to its spread, especially, like I said, Protestant leaders like Queen Elizabeth in England during this time. Um, you have, right, Denmark as well, supporting guys like Brahe and Kepler. You had in Austria, you had Galileo. Um, was basically um, working for the Italians, the Medicis, who also right have hands in France's uh, monarchy and government moving forward. Okay. You see astrology take a back seat, though, eventually during the Enlightenment because, you know, um, exploration really wasn't a huge focus at that time. Um, so astrology isn't quite as important to people um, by that time. So if you look at the peasantry, and this is kind of proving that the Renaissance and the science wasn't for the lower classes. It was for people who have wealth, who had time and money to experiment and, you know, conduct these things and do these things. Uh, peasants and lower class people generally had to work all the time. They didn't have time or money 
um, to come up with the technologies or the time, you know, uh, time needed to study these things. So in the oral culture of peasants during this time, and we're talking mid 1500s into the 1600s, belief that the cosmos was governed by divine and demonic forces still persisted. So that Christian view, you know, um, that the world is still governed by God and these forces that we can't still, still exist. And I could say, you know, largely still exist today. I mean, most people, I believe in God. I believe there's some, I don't know, I believe, you know, whatever, but I believe there's some, you know, spiritual or, or, or divine realm that has its play in things, right? People who don't believe that are atheists, right? But the point is, the reason this has us in the notes is because people are now moving, like I said, more and more away from the church. And mainly because of the findings of science and astrology and all these things we've just looked at. All right. Uh, magic was still kind of a a belief, like things that you could see with the eye. I'm just mentioning this because this will tie into the enlightenment and witchcraft and stuff. Um, things that they couldn't explain yet with science uh, was considered magic. And magic... Since it couldn't be explained, what do people do when they can't explain things? They turn to religion. I'm not trying to be, you know, could have said that probably nicer, but, you know, and that's what people did, you know. They couldn't explain it, so it must not be from God because it's not helping anybody, this magic, so it must be of the devil. So most magic was associated with devil or demonic forces, those sort of things, because nowhere in the Bible would it mention those occurrences, so therefore it can't be of God. Right? Because God never talked about it. But we'll come back to that. All right, guys. I know that was a long one. But, um, yeah, please uh, email me if you've got any questions. And I'll see you in our meeting here soon. Sure.